in the world through the eyes of Gordon Parks, and I am super excited. I just have to tell you all, I was telling Tracy before this started that I could talk all afternoon about this. Um, so she's going to have to like meet me or take out the virtual, um, you know, uh, uh, thing to get me off the, get me off the stage. But you are in for a super treat because um, I am here to discuss all things Gordon Parks with two amazing people. Uh, first is the author of the uh, Big Idea, Kirk Sharp. Um, and he is the director of the Gordon, Spar Gordon Parks Museum in Fort Scott. And we are also here with Annette Billings. And Annette is an African-American Kansas poet, playwright, actress, and nurse who shares her poetry and prose at speaking events. So first, you know, I, I've been learning all I've been a fan of Gordon Parks for a while, but in preparation for this, I've just been learning so much more about him. So I was wondering, you know, by a show of, you know, a reaction or a comment in the chat. So how many of you knew, or you can raise your hands, that he was a photographer? I think for me, that's how I first came to know him was through his amazing um, photography. What about an author? Did you all know that he wrote books? Yeah? I just learned that he was a poet as well. Did anybody else know that? Poet? Uh, later in life, I think, maybe is when he would publish more of his poets, poems. Um, then um, a filmmaker. We uh, saw some clips from Shaft there. And then, uh, did, did anybody know that he was a composer? Because that music we were listening to, he wrote that. So um, just a true Renaissance man, as Kirk um, mentions in, in, his, um, in his big idea. Um, so we're gonna try to get to do as much of it as we can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just wanted first, to see what those uh, other charts are like. The big idea yeah. is a Humanities Kansas initiative showcasing sure, sure, sure. fresh ideas from humanities scholars to spark conversations about ideas that shape our world. Some housekeeping yes, reminders. We uh, want everybody to be muted, and so we're going to do that. Um, if you have any questions, please ask. Um, you can type them in the chat or you can raise your hand and then at the end um, we'll have time for, for your questions as well and I'm going to guess that there are going to be tons of them. Um, so I'm again super excited um, and I think we're going to start with this photography first. Um, and you know I, one of his most iconic pieces and it was shared in the the big idea if you had a chance to to look through that was um you know his um um work that um was a um a, a, uh, homage, but a critical homage to, um, you know, the, the, the painting. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, his work back to Fort Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, um, just share my screen with you. He photographed these um, set of paintings in um, 1950, and he was originally commissioned in, you, Kirk, you can correct me if I'm wrong, by um, uh, Life magazine, I believe, to go back to Fort Scott and to to search out his um, classmates from the segregated school that he um, junior high that he graduated from. And so this is the series of photos that um, that came out of it. These are just a, a few of them that you can see there can be found at the. Gordon Parks um, Foundation uh, website, and I think we're going to share the link in the in the chat, so you can click on it on your own screen if you like. Um, but 
I wanted to look at these photos, you know, from kind of a historical view and, and see what they tell us about, you know, race relations, especially during this time of um, segregation, right? Because this is pre-Brown. This is, um, um, you know, pre-Montgomery bus boycott. Um, so, um, Annette, Kirk, what, what, what do you think Parks was trying to convey through this series with his quote unquote weapon of choice? I think the year was uh, 1950 or in the 1950s that he did uh, that series of, of photographs. And I think that he was concerned with uh, representing the every, everydayness, the, the, the day to day struggles and triumphs and uh, concerns and challenges of, uh, of African American people in Fort Scott, uh, in the state in the world at that time. Yeah. yeah. Yes, he wanted to help combat the stereotype, stereotypism of black families of the, of the culture, because uh, it wasn't represented well um, through the media, newspapers, movies, and films. And this project was near and dear to his heart, and it, it challenged him to come back, because of course, you know, there was some bitter times during his times in Kansas, but he also wanted to see and what happened to these uh, classmates and that resulted of a migration from, uh, from them to as well, from Fort Scott to other various places. Yeah, and that's one of the things that strikes me so much about these photos is just the humanity that, you know, mm -hmm. comes through in this sense of, um, of family and speaking of, that's just uncle <laughs> right there. Um, and uh, one of the things he found out through um, coming back to Fort Scott and looking at, you know, trying to f photograph his, his former classmates was that, you know, as um, you mentioned, a lot of them had moved on. So there were photos from Detroit and St. Louis and Chicago, you know, part of that um, great, uh, great migration but i just love all the i don't know like even even the, the fashion right that that we see um see in these photos and i believe uh, go ahead i says it shows the comfortability that they all had that all of gordon's photos that he's taken throughout the world of everybody that he brings a certain comfort level because he's able to take some intimate photos of them mm -hmm. into their home, invite them into the home to tell them things that they probably wouldn't tell anybody and that he's allowed to share that. And so that shows that the trust level that Gordon uh, is able to convey with others when he takes this photography and he, he just shows to the right imagery and right light. Um, and I think what inspired him is, of course, the segregation too as well. Like um, yeah. this could probably, it was a stormy time according to the essay when he went down there it was raining thundering and uh, sometimes the clouds were lifted and gordon he really used poetry and everything he did and i think this probably is, this mm -hmm. photo in particular probably could represent the time a storm is coming through fort scott saying the same storm is lingering through segregation too as well so um yes. that really yeah. helped them uh, he and it helped him going back to, to memory lane of course it, he remembers some good times too as well yeah, and you know, these photos proved so provocative that the magazine eventually did not publish them. Exactly. You know, exactly. so it was only later in life that, you know, they're exhibited now all around, all around the world. So. I imagine that, that Life magazine was looking at the, the sellability of those photos and chose, I would say, profit over uh, the authenticity that Gordon Parks entered into doing those photos. Right. It's great to see that he was eventually given a claim for those photos. I think it was a museum in Boston that initially Yes. The um, spark the, the Yes. Yeah, sparked that the photo with the in front of the Liberty Theater and they just I had a very unnamed sort or unnamed title of the photo and that really helped to uh, 
to create that endeavor to try to find more about that connection to the photos and with the connection with the, the foundation too uh, in New York as well. Mm -hmm. And during that time, Gordon went that, that photo you had before with the pool hall. Um, he went down certain places in town that he remembered. Uh, I remember uh, he said he started out going to the east side of Fort Scott versus the west side and kind of saved the west side for best cause, for last because that was meant more to him west side because he lived more on the west side but this is one of the corridors from the pool hall on uh, first street and he mentions how some of the same regulars he remembers in fort scott for instance uh the gentleman with the greyhound dog is ed parks cousin to gordon parks and mm -hmm. the gentleman beside him his name's otto i think the last name baker or motley can't remember but he recognizes him as essay about one of the regulars uh in Fort Scott, uh, maybe he's probably is part of the buildings. He's been, he's just part of the community. And then of course the gentleman with the hat is Peaches Jenkins. He's the manager of the, uh, the pool hall there too as well. So he had, remember those connections and he wanted to uh, uh, take photos of those and show the, the, how the community strives the best they can during segregated times. And also how it is segregated, how they had to do their own, um, restaurants and bars and stores and and they weren't allowed to go into the drugstore to eat and dine they could purchase um ice cream but they had to eat outside and that's one of the photos that yeah. showed along with the photo with the theater that uh blacks could go into the movie theater to pay the ticket but they had to eat they had to sit in the, the peanut section mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. up in the balcony so yes yes yeah yeah, I like this one too because it's almost like another version of American Gothic, right? Except it's not the pitchfork; it's the Bible that that uh, that he's holding. So I mean, all of his photos are just so expressive and tell such um, you know such stories. Um, he had another photo, not a part of this series, that was uh, labeled his American Gothic Gothic in Washington D.C. And it was actually a, a photo of uh, the woman who cleaned the building where his um, uh, organization was based out of. And he received a lot of flack for, for that photo, that American Gothic, because his supervisor uh, thought that it indicted all of America. And he encouraged uh, Gordon Parks to take other pictures of that particular woman besides just uh, the one that symbolized American Gothic. So we see that theme throughout his work. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, since we're on Fort, um, Fort Scott and stories, let's, let's move to literature. And I want to start with Learning Tree, which is his semi-autobiographical um, novel that was um, published in 1963. Um, so on the surface, this is kind of like, this is, a, this is a coming of age story, right? It's about Parks when he's like 12, 13. Um, and it, it's set in a small Kansas town. Um, in what way like, is this story unique to kind of the genre of, um, the uh, coming of age story, especially for, you know, this time period, 1963. Now we're post Brown, we're post Montgomery um, boycott, you know, and the other thing that really struck me about the learning tree as I was re reading it was that Parks had also photographed some other really famous authors, you know, um, Richard Wright um, among them. Um, and so, um, yeah, what, 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 um, how, how is this story, even though it was still set in the 20s, resonates today? What are some of the themes that, that you see? Well, you can see a lot of it. It's, uh, it resonated then in 63, um, as much as it resonating, resonating now in 2020. It's, it's a lot of a, a story about a young man growing up in segregation, poverty and segregation, and, uh, dealing with a lot of things, love, social injustice, racism, um, uh, fighting, uh, education, just the whole various things. And it, but to me, the film shows again that there 
wasn't very much res good representation of, of uh, black families and black cultures through the films and movies. And Gordon used the learning tree from a, from a perspective that showed honest truth and dignity that uh, showed them in a better light, showed them that they're, they're not uh, just maids or the family of maids or butlers and they have pivotal roles, they have pivotal lives and everything's impacted. The social justice uh, is, just resonates throughout the whole film with the racism and discrimination and the, the, the police brutality um, from the sheriff in the film and, and the book too as well. It's just very uh, echoes to the same things that's happening today. Uh, and then it's a very important film in 1989, the film itself was placed in the Library of Congress and, and the National Film Register of Classic Films. And, that just shows you, if you look at this film now and read the book now, it's, it's just, uh, you're seeing the same thing happening now, uh, mm -hmm. but just at a different generation. Yes. And the, the, the thought of the, the central character in The Learning Tree was a young uh, black boy just trying to, to find himself and, and to grow into himself. But every moment of every, day and night, he was at risk of being harmed, uh, misjudged, uh, mistreated, just because he was a Black boy. And even it, it also touched on um, the, the hazards of uh, being a young Black uh, female in, mm -hmm. in the learning industry, where his, his very good friend, and I can't recall her name in the, in the, in the movie, uh. Uh, uh, it's right on the tip of my tongue, but uh, the fact that, that she was uh, assaulted by uh, one of her classmates or one of her mm -hmm. uh, associates and uh, the kinds of things that she had to deal with as a young black girl. Mm -hmm. so, I, and I agree, Kirk. I think the, the film, the movie is every bit as relevant today as it was those years ago. And I, I liked, too, that they showed a very intact uh, family, a mother, a father, and, and loving siblings, and that uh, the central character mostly wanted to do the right thing. Right. And was some, and that was made doing the right thing, living the right life was made particularly difficult for him because of his the color of his skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Family is definitely a, um, a central theme in in the book and in, in, in showing showing the town you know as he remembered it warts and all and you have you know the um incarceration also of the young young black mm -hmm. man who yes. was um part of um, the main characters um circle and how that you know um sending him away to um a juvenile detention and how that just affected him for the worse Right. Um, so there's, you know, those, um, those themes uh, spreading out as well. Um, but as I mentioned, um, Parks was also a poet. And if you all have never heard Annette Reed, you are in for a treat. I asked her to pick a couple of uh, Parks poems to, to read, for, read for us, and we can talk about it afterwards. But I'm just going to turn it over and be quiet because this, you'll, you all love it. Well, I, I am nurse and particularly poet by nature. And I grew up thinking of Gordon Parks, the wonderful a uh, magnificent photographer and had not really heard that he was a poet or heard uh, or read any of his poetry. So I was particularly excited to know that one of his arts was a poetry. Uh, the ones I chose, the first one is called The Funeral. After many snows, I was home again. Time had whittled down to mere hills, the great mountains of my childhood. Raging rivers I had once swam trickled like gentle streams. And the wide road curving on to China or Kansas City or perhaps Calcutta had withered to a crooked path of dust, ending abruptly at the county burial ground. Only the only giant that remained the same 
a hundred strong men strained beneath his coffin when they bore him to his grave. Shall I read the second and we talk about both or shall we read, talk about yes, each one? Yeah, no, go ahead. Read the second read one as well. Okay. Despite the turmoil, anguish and despair disrupting the planet we inherited, there is something good I choose to sing about. That something lies within us patiently waiting beneath us, above us, and around us. It's a peaceful message yearning to fill us, our places of murderous anger and hatred to flourish forever. Hope is a song I have chosen to sing, a deathless song flowing steadily beside my faith. Whenever the fist of doubt knocks at my door, it is powerfully turned away by my hopeful singing. When things go from bad to worse, I still sing my song. Why not? It helps me endure the bloodthirsty days. Once earth had devoured my hopes and twisted my soul, it's twisted, my twisted soul slid toward hell. Fate came racing from another direction. Pinned, it, pinned to it was a belt of sun with new instructions. These, it said, are for you. Suddenly fear was gone. I made peace with the mean roads I'd walked. My jackals could now lie down in truce. From that day on, I began singing the song called Hope. I still sing it loud above the waves, fire, darkness, and mud. Wow. You know, as you were reading, I just, I, it also made me think of him as a, a photographer too, because I'm, I was, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, he chose those words with the mm -hmm. same care mm -hmm. and precision and thought that went into like framing a subject in a, in a, a photograph, you know, and just like the phrases he used, especially in that last one, for me, they were also evocative of um, Langston Hughes, you know, especially when you talked about hope and, um, um, and, and, and that. So what made you choose those two poems? The, the funeral, I loved it for its brevity, authenticity, and its depth. A writing about the funeral of his father, one of my favorite lines is that it's a hundred strong men strain beneath his coffin when they bore him to his grave. Now one could say, oh, well, it, it, he was writing, um, using imagery of a hundred men having to carry his father. No, there were a hundred men carrying his father because of uh, the depth of uh, Gordon Park's love for him and his respect for him. So I think just in that line, he, he tells volumes about how much he cared for his father and uh, all fathers, I believe. So that, that one, I, I loved how, he, how much he did with so few words. And I, I, I see uh, barely any line between his photography and his poetry, his other writing too, his novels and, and essays. And I think you're right that he used the same care and concern, no matter what art he was uh, doing at the time or sharing at the time. He, he was marvelous. And the second one, I, I have a thing for hope <laughs> still. <laughs> and um, I, I love how he, he talks about how it's, it stayed with him and that it is a song that he chose to sing. I think hope is a choice. Uh, that we make versus despair sometimes, versus fatigue, versus racism, that hope really does endure. And it's not just a, a, a phrase on a Hallmark card. It is a real, true, strong, necessary thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, it, it's just, you know, like I said at the beginning, I'm just so in awe that he is just so good at so many things, <laughs> you, yes. you know. Yeah. Um, I was, I put in the chat the, the book that I was reading that includes the um, poem, The Funeral. And as I was reading it, I was just like, oh my gosh, this man is just so talented. And, you know, most of it self-taught or just, you know, God-given talent. <laughs> you know? A lot of both. It's, this is talent and self-taught and driven and determination. And I think he's just one of those people just, you just don't see in a lifetime, uh, maybe mm -hmm. once and he's it. And that, it's just incredible what he can achieve. When most people achieve that type of success in one field, but he's achieved that yes. type of success yes. in multiple fields. Yes. That's just is phenomenal and renaissance man is just perfect what he is is it's, it's a gift of determination it's he was just destined no matter what and i think he's and i tell people all the time i said i don't care what he wanted to do it's what he chose to do and he was going to be good at it it's that mm -hmm. even a professional basketball player he was a wonderful basketball yes. player. he could yes he could have done that he could have just done anything he wanted to do i think there was a, a lovely fearlessness about him to to take the chance of mm -hmm. uh, involving himself in all these arts and uh, um, and if there was any self-doubt or uh, wonder in him he was able to put that aside in order yeah. to do yeah. well in each of those arts in, in a good morning america interview they challenged him but he he he's does so much of so many fields what do you enjoy most and and gordon went on to say if i had to pick and choose it'd be poetry uh, because that's, I can communicate with the world uh, with that and express myself. And um, it's, it's a quiet opportunity to be, you know, to, to be thought, thought process with that. So it's, it's amazing because he, he mentioned he included poetry in all things he did and the photography. And if you look back, um, he's always putting poetry into the stuff. And uh, so that was very interesting to understand yeah. that. And when you think of all that he's accomp he accomplished with despite the odds against him, right? We were talking about the learning tree and the movie and, and you know, the book and the movie and the, you know, the learning tree was like the, the, the first movie directed by an African-American that came out of a major studio. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And that was 69. And then we have Shaft in 1971 and two polar opposite movies, I think, maybe in many ways. Um, we can argue, um, you know, Shaft being the um, kind of one of the, the first and probably most iconic of the black exploitation uh, or so called black exploitation um, films. And, uh, you know, two things. One, Learning Tree, right, filmed in Fort Scott, so he wanted to really go back to his his roots, you know, uh, and use as many, um, you know, African Americans as part of the technical crew, you know, as well. And then Shaft, and then if you, you all watch that, just the... Mm, I mean, from the opening shot to the end, it's just almost a love affair with the streets of New York, you know, and the, the care that he puts into, you know, every frame of, of um, that film. So um, I'll, I'll ask you kind of the same question I did about the, um, his writings is that, you know, what was it about these two films that resonated so much at the time they were released and still resonate today. I was just reading last week an article in the New York Times and it was about Shaft, <laughs> you know? So people are still writing about Gordon Parks and all that, all that he's done. I remember uh, when Shaft came out and I don't know if I was old enough to, to literally go to see that rated film. I can't remember what it was rated at the time, but I did see it. And I, I think what, what struck me, what strikes me now that I probably didn't fully realize then was that uh, John Shaft was a, was a strong, solid, independent businessman, uh, you know, ab about the business of, of uh, finding uh, the kidnapped uh, daughter 
even the music, the Thinker Shack is incomparable uh, in the way that it's uh, laid out and played. It's, it's just, a, it's an experience really to listen to it. And I, I think that he used um, uh, music in the soundtrack of the learning tree too in, in a different way, but not, not any less effectively. Right. He's very good at uh, matching music to scenes and, and photography. And uh, going to see Shaft was a, a prerequisite for being cool <laughs> when I was uh, was growing up. And I was just, we were just happy to see uh, an Asian motion picture with a, a, a black actor in the in the lead and to have such a, a claim for uh, the music. Yes, black exploitation, but it also uh, gave jobs to the uh, actors and actresses who went on to do uh, different kinds of uh, kinds of work. And I think it was important. It was an important movie. Yes, it was an incredible movie. It's you know, it's as I tell students, uh, youth of the day, it's it's the first time uh, you have a blockbuster film in Hollywood, and it so I had a lead actor with a lot of other cast of black actors that are black, and that is the first. Denzel Washington character. That's the first Will Smith character. That's the first. And it was a, iconic. And I try to relate it in terms of that they probably understand today, like Black Panther. Uh, when that was a cultural blockbuster hit that trans, uh, tra transcribed the, the, the world to understand that's what a uh, powerful message that it brought. And that's what Shaft did in 71. It's, it's, and Gordon had a lot. Uh, he put his thumb on that whole film to even the character of Shaft, the way he walked, the way he talked. And, and mm -hmm. some suggest that John Shaft is an alter ego of Gordon Parks. Mm -hmm. And if you look some of the mannerisms of how yes. Shaft walks and talks and how he handles himself, that's Gordon yes. Parks. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and the movie just spawned so much too, right? You know, like um, imitation films, right, by others. Um, and, you know, you mentioned uh, Shaq being the character for, you know, the future um, uh, Will Smith, et cetera, right? Well, we have Samuel L. Jackson in yeah. the 2019 yeah. <laughs> uh, remake of, of Shaft. And I mean, for today, that's, that's um, also pretty iconic. But then there's fashion, right? I own a leather jacket that's pretty similar to Shaft's and it's yeah. one of my prized possessions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the film is a really a uh, uh, breaking ground for cultural um, transition. It's it's the 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 cultural impact from that film is still resonating today, from the urban uh, uh, gritty to the sound to the films to the music to the style to the dress. That's really created a lot of the things we have today. And of course, I think he didn't realize he didn't set out to make the very first film that helped spark off the black exploitation films, but um, that's what it did. And, it, and other movie studios saw that and said, why can't we do that? We need to do that. And then it's a copycat industry mm -hmm. and they tried to do that, but that's not what Gordon set out to do. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. definitely. I think it was a good example of showing uh, uh, African-Americans and uh, the entire country, uh, yes, uh, we can do it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, compose, write, act, uh, direct. We can, we can do it all and do it, and do it well. There was a source, I think that uh, the movie was a great source of, of pride and, and was a, a jumping off place for many other works, many other films. Yeah, because yeah. you didn't have, and this is the 70s, Growing up, and I grew up in the 70s, you never saw uh, black actors or or cast or that many. If you did, you're going to get glued to that TV and you're going to watch it. You're going to film. You're going to mm -hmm. see that film. And, it, you sh and you have pride and you see that. Yeah. Well, you know, and I was looking for a copy of um, the movie so I could I could watch it. And what I came across was the Shaft TV series the Shaft comic books, you know, that's when I saw there was a remake with Samuel L. Jackson. So yeah, I just spawned this, you know, in, in entire industry. Um, 
I also want to turn to just just briefly to to pay homage to you know his well-roundedness. Um, we talked a little bit about how he composed the music for The Learning Tree and then um, Shaft's big score and some other movies, but he also composed music for a ballet about Martin Luther King Jr. that aired um, on PBS in the 1990s, and I believe it was for this um, those compositions that he won an Emmy Award. So, um, just and you can find actually that ballet and that score on on YouTube. That's how that's how I found it. But you know, just like um, uh, know if you want to speak to you know his his music, Kirk or Annette. Or... I, I just think how remarkable it was that uh, one that a great artist was paying homage to a great uh, leader. And how Martin Luther King's life presented such uh, fertile ground for uh, Warden Parks to uh, plant his, his music and, and the movement of the ballet. And it seemed very fitting that it was um, uh, presented on Martin Luther King's birthday, leading, I don't know, I don't know the date, but I bet Kirk could tell the date. It was 1999, I can't remember the exact date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it was just a wonderful work. And that, that he uh, used movement. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he just did it all, oil painting, uh, novelist. So I, I think he, he needed to live as long as he did in order to do all the things that he did. Mm -hmm. And had he lived longer, we would have had more to uh, speak about on his behalf. Yeah, he was he was asked why he chose the classic ballet for tribute to Martin. He and he responded by basically simply saying that Martin Luther King uh, deserves to be in the classics, and that's how he thought about that. And of course, Mar uh, Martin yes. enjoyed ballet too as well, and so that's why he wanted to make that tribute uh, to Martin Luther King because he was a follower of Martin Luther King. He he believed the legacy that he left mm -hmm. was to instill in all of us to keep the faith, keep hope within ourselves and believe in each other and, and keep marching on and keep fighting for freedom, for social justice and yes. equality for everybody. And he felt like Martin Luther King was extremely brave to do what he did uh, because it's tough to walk peacefully in a protest, peaceful protest, and you know, you're going to get beat down and, and not strike. and that's bravery. And some probably felt that that was not, but Gordon, of course, you know, that's one of the toughest, bravest things you can do. And Gordon mentioned, he didn't only think he can um, do that, but he, he really truly followed uh, Martin Luther King and had um, great respect for him. You know, Kirk, as you were talking, it occurred to me, you know, we think a lot about like Parks as, you know, this great artist, and of course he was, but he was also a historian, right? Yeah. With not just this ballet and, and a tribute to Martin Luther King Jr., but through his photographs, through the movies, through the books, you know, he really drew on like not just his own personal history, but the history of African Americans in this country and how that um, shaped their their lives, you know. Um, throughout you know the periods that um that he yeah and he he started that with richard wright's uh book uh, 12 million black voices and that really uh, sparked him to read a lot more to learn more about the history and stuff so and you're right i think he was uh, possibly you know, a true uh, historian in that aspect to read and learn and, and know why uh, things have happened and to, and to help be that voice and be that champion yeah yeah. So we have a question in the chat and I'll encourage everybody else to put their questions in the chat. We're going to move on to their in, um, questions in a second. But did he choreograph the ballet as well? Do you know? That I don't know. That I'm not sure. That's an interesting um, question though. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know either. Um, well, Kirk, since we have you here and since people may not know about your awesome museum, so can you tell us about the Gordon Parks Museum at Fort Scott? How did it come to be? Um, I know you have so many wonderful artifacts in there. If you can just like highlight that and then what we all really want to know is are you currently open? <laughs> yes, we're currently open. Um, of course, we're asking folks to come to call ahead with uncertainty of everything. Um, it, everybody has to wear a mask. 
um, once they're um, here into the museum. And we're on the campus of Fort Scott Community College in Fort Scott, Kansas. And uh, we started in 2004 with a steering committee to establish a celebration in Gordon Park's name. And it came to be a very success. And we won that celebration and hoped that Gordon would attend. And he did, did attend that celebration, kind of a reunion of certain uh, aspects with the Learning Tree film cast and crew and members and and Gordon was moved by that and he uh, donated to us 30 of his uh, iconic gallery prints for us to help display for our diversity center that we established then. And then uh, we from then on we were able to get um, his personal um, items, memorabilia, awards, medals, um, suits, clothes, uh, some furniture. We also have replica furniture of his piano, replica furniture of his uh, uh, of his uh, furniture in his apartment that he had in New York, and um, we have a wide uh, range of other photographs of Gordon Parks. We have uh, some of his music collection. We have uh, some of his uh, several of his. Uh, certifications and proclamations and resolutions that he was in the in honorary degrees too as well. Uh, we try to, our focus here at the museum is to always to celebrate Gordon Park's life and his remarkable life story to, to help teach others artistic creativity and cultural awareness and diversity that's in all of our lives. And we want to keep his life story alive to help teach others, to help uh, keep his legacy going and to continue with that. We do with the annual celebration. Uh, we continue with that celebration since uh, 2004. We done 16 successfully celebrations this year due to COVID. We decided to be safe to help ensure the safety of the community visitors and students. We decided to not have the celebration. Um, I was telling somebody the other day, it just felt like a void because we're so used to doing that. Um, so next year, we are going to plan again for the celebration October 7th through the 9th of 2021, um, hopefully in person. But if not, we're going to make some adjustments, have backup plans. We're going to be very, really better prepared for um, any pandemic that might be still out. Hopefully not. Hopefully we get through all this. And um, we'll probably do some stuff online or do some virtual um, online or Zoom sometime, but we will celebrate somehow, some way uh, next year. And you all sponsor a pho photography competition as well. Is that yeah. a yearly thing? Or? Yes, mm -hmm. and we just got through doing one, uh, our photo contest. Uh, normally we do it through the celebration. We decided to go uh, continue with the photo contest. And this year's theme was on social justice, diversity, and equity. And we had some very powerful uh, photos that really uh, we asked them to kind of write a small little short sentence, not so much of an essay, to what inspired them. And uh, very tremendous work out there. It was, it was very wonderful, very powerful. And we're also working on a project currently right now to uh, create signage for the, you mentioned the Learning Tree film that was filmed here in Fort Scott, Kansas in 1968. Um, with a lot of the locations that was filmed is still intact. And we want to keep, again, a way to keep that legacy alive, keep that history, because it is the historical uh, time when Gordon came down and did that film. And so we're going to create signage at different locations throughout the, the community of Fort Scott and surrounding area, along with Lynn County. There's, he did film in there too at the Mount City Courthouse. And along with the signs, have some uh, graphic photos, uh, behind the scene uh, field footage, and then also we'll have QR codes too as well, where folks can access different links to information and try to create a virtual tour with that too as well. So that's a progress, a, a project that right now that's currently in progress and hope, we're hoping our goal is to have that done um, by August of 2021. Oh, awesome, something to look forward to. And those photos from the, um, the competition for this year, they're on your website, correct? They're currently on our website and our Facebook page too as well. And we extended the display. We have it on exhibit. It was scheduled to be on exhibit from November 2nd to the 13th, but we went ahead and extended that exhibit uh, to the end of uh, next week. 
Awesome. Well, we have a question from Julie, and she asks, um, if Parks was alive today, what topics or themes would he point his camera towards, or what would he be writing about? I, I would certainly think he'd, he'd be writing about social justice and equality and diversity, the things that Kirk mentioned. Uh, I think freedom, courage, and certainly uh, hope, creating hope, holding on to hope, using hope. I think he would be, um, I think he'd be able to, sh to share a lot uh, with his work these days. Yes, I agree. I think he'll target those same areas. Um, I think he would do that through expression, obviously, through poetry. I think you'd see a lot of poetry coming out with that and also with the photography too as well. And uh, I think he'd find, continue to find creative ways to continue to show that uh, his expression of what he picked up a camera for um, all those many years ago to fight against racism, discrimination, and poverty. Mm -hmm. He always has been the champion of uh, fighting against uh, social injustice. And I think he wants to be that one that could help express what others might not be able to express through his poetry, through his photography, through right. even filmmaking. He might, I can see he's probably doing some short films that's very popular yes. now, trending yes. today. Just, I think he would just be very creative in that and, and uh, he would get that message across somehow, yes. some way and continue that fight. A, a Gordon Parks TikTok jumped into my head, so that's why I was laughing. So. <laughs> but I could also see stunning portraits of um, our vice president-elect, right? Um, that would be that would be um, amazing. Oh yes, and, and somebody said that he would have an Instagram account for sure. <laughs> Um, so, Annette, a question for you. Who else inspires yes. your own work as a poet? Uh, you know, initially, uh, my work as a poet was inspired about the people immediately around my life, my family, particularly my, my mother, uh, people I went to school with, teachers. I, I loved and continue to love um, educators. Uh, these days, I'm inspired by a variety of things. Everything from how sunlight hits a blade of grass or a stalk of weed to what I hear on CNN. So it, it takes uh, very little to inspire me. I find that the act of just living and interacting with other people fills me with a wealth of ideas. You know, as giving those ideas to paper, that's uh, the, the labor of of being a poet, but it's, it's certainly a labor of, of love. Yeah, and you know, um, what you said made me think too, you know, about your inspiration with the, the blade of grass and everything that, you know, Park's very much known for his um, um, portraits, right, of people, but he also has some stunning photographs of the Kansas landscape um, that, that, that he um, photographed, I think, um, later in life. So um, just, yeah, well, well rounded. Um, other questions that people have for Kirk or Nett or anything in the parks, comments? This has just been such a, you know, such a rich discussion with so much, um, so many things to um, touch on. And again, if you um, have not been to Fort Scott, to the museum, it's, it's amazing, um, you know, not just can you see his photographs, but you can see cameras and, you know, even the, the film camera he used. Um, so, and they have a stunning, we were talking about fashion, I had mentioned fashion, stunning collection. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Kurt, of, of um, Barca's wardrobe because he was really a um, fastidious man and, um, yeah. Yes, we also have uh, his actual one of his cameras that he used too as well, and some other uh, more gallery iconic photos of him that we got donated from the Mercy Hospital collection uh, that he Gordon gave to the hospital in Fort Scott in 2002. Uh, and so uh, we're we're 
love to see you folks come down here. Please give us a call at 620-223-2700. Our extension is 5850. Or you can email us at gordonparkscenter.org at fortscott.edu. I'm sorry, Gordon Park Center at fortscott.edu. Our website is, is gordonparkscenter.org. And the website for the museum is in the chat, as is Annette's um, website. Um, and um, if you haven't read The Big Idea, please do so. Kirk also put in there some ideas for further um, discussion about parks and um, um, just to, to, to keep the um, topic going. So. We appreciate you both being here, Kirk and Annette, and thank you for the discussion. Thank and thank you everyone for attending. This was really awesome. Glad you could spend um, some time with us. And uh, thank you for coming.